So we got the puppy locked up. If, for those of you at home, uh, if I start acting weird, it's because we have an adorable puppy on the loose that's going to nibble my ankles. So uh, it wouldn't be pleb lab with a lot of a little bit of uh, controlled chaos. But hi guys, I'm Jim. I am one of the new residents here at pleb lab, and I'm here to talk to you about our project Lightning Door. What is Lightning Door? It is an access control system for Pleb Lab's front door that lets you gain entry into Pleb Lab in exchange for sats paid over Lightning. So the way it works is you scan an LN URL from the NFC or QR code, you open your wallet and pay, and once the payment's received, the Lightning Bolt will turn on indicating the door is unlocked and you can enter Pleb Lab. So three-step process shown here. Before we dig into it, let's, uh, let's go a little into my background, who I am, why you should listen to me. My name's Jim, I'm an engineer. I got my training primarily in hardware and I just have a passion for developing products. So that curiosity and passion led me to doing a lot of embedded systems and C programming and eventually going more entrepreneurial directions with application development and eventually Bitcoin and Lightning. Here's some of the things that I've worked on. I love shipping digital and physical products alike. So I've worked at some big companies. Um, I've shipped some of my own apps from scratch. I'm currently working on Sphinx Chat, if you've heard of that. Shout out to the Sphinx team and Paul. Great team. It's a lightning based chat app and the first ever podcasting 2.0 app. But I've also worked at some big companies working on mass produced physical products, DC power systems, lithium ion batteries, Bluetooth enabled con and controlled devices. And lightning door is the type of project I love because it touches the digital and the physical space in a unique way. And because I love Bitcoin. So let's start with the motivation. Why do we do this? Plato said necessity is the mother of invention. He's a smart dude, but in this case, I beg to differ. In this case, laziness is the mother of invention. So we got tired of kind of sitting on the second floor of Pleb Lab in the zone coding and having to go downstairs and answer the doorbell. So we thought this would be a nice little solution for that. So there are, are <coughs> excuse me. Pleb Lab has, a, has a, no, a limited number of physical keys that's reserved for monthly users. So we have a lot of drop-ins. So they would constantly be uh, have to live in fear that they wouldn't be able to get back in if they had to leave or something. So they're constantly ringing the doorbell. And as previously mentioned, it's very distracting and onerous when you're trying to do hacker stuff and uh, you have to break your concentration to go get the front door. So we had a great opportunity to offload the administrative burden from our team and do some really cool stuff with Lightning. What I love about this project is that it really highlights the greatness of Pleb Lab, having a bunch of really enthusiastic technologists, really smart people all in one space, all with different disciplines. So in this case, we had CM Druid, AKA Topher, coming in with a wealth of knowledge about Lightning, Bitcoin, and access control systems. He's working on some really great stuff over at Bidescrow, and Topher is actually a contractor on access control systems, so that came in really handy. You had me. Uh, Uncle Jim 21, I have experience with a lot of low-level systems, hardware, embedded systems, application software, and just physical products. So it was my job a lot of the time to go in and just take a competing product and take it apart, reverse engineer it. So that uh, that came in handy. So I, I know a lot of things about how to you know do surgery on various things and make it work together. And then lastly, we had Max. Shout out to Max at Eden, Eden 3D Printers. If you need a uh, 3D printer, Go to Max, he's a great guy, Bitcoiner. He hooked us up with a really cool NFC enabled Bitcoin sign that you saw uh, in the earlier graphic that we'll show you in the demo later. He was kind enough to print us those signs to use and if you really need something, check out his website, Eden3dprinters.com. And uh, so, so this project is very much an illustration of what happens when you get a bunch of passionate Bitcoiners together in a high signal environment and just let stuff happen. So shout out to Pleb Lab for creating that environment and you kind of introducing us to each other. This is one of the great things about Pleb Lab. So let's dive back into the actual project. So I always like to start with, you know, what are the requirements? So um, first we have the ability to accept lightning payments, uh, preferably in a way that allows for dynamic pricing for reasons we'll get into later. Second, we have the ability to have open hours. So we have some rather interesting neighbors here on sixth street. So, uh, some good OPSEC is really important here. We want to make sure that one of us is around when the door is being used. So we don't have to have, you know, a random walk in uh, and, not, and have to worry about, you know, security issues. And third, it is quite difficult to detect the strike moving by either hearing it or just pulling on the door constantly. So we noticed that in one of the first iterations, we were able to unlock the door, but we didn't have a way to 
kind of identify uh, the fact that the door was unlocked. So we want a simple way to indicate to the user that the payment is a success and they have access to Pleb Lab. So those are the three core requirements. So we're able to address each of those requirements in turn with different technologies. So on the Lightning side, we used LN URL plus LN bits instance hooked up to Legends that allowed us to do the dynamic pricing and uh, you know the async uh, uh, you know messaging back and forth between the payer and our server. We used a uh, very high tech solution for open hours. We used a mechanical ti uh, timer switch that can turn on and off the Bitcoin switch hardware, uh, depending on open hours. So it just runs on a timer and it just, it, the contacts literally, you know, runs on a rotating timer and the contacts literally move out and remove power to the control system when we're outside open hours. Lastly, lastly, we use the lightning bolt neon site. Uh, uh, the, we use the lightning bolt neon sign. Um, we ripped up the control circuit and um and ended up hooking it up to you know step down converter so that we could indicate when the strike circuit is active so that way you have an uh, an indicator of you know the light the door's unlocked and you're good to go in okay so next i want to get into this block diagram so there's a lot going on here it looks really complex but it's really not that bad um, we're gonna start on the left side so Remember that, you know, prerequisite for all this, we'll start in the bottom left corner. The prerequisite for all this is that we're inside the open hours. So we set that to 9.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. So during that time, the door is enabled. Outside of that, it's disabled. So the mechanical timer switch uh, it actually controls power to the rest of the system that allows the access control to function. So assuming that that's in, move to step one, which would be the user just scans the LN URL from either the NFC or the QR code. So they get, uh, they get a URL, then they will open their wallet, which has to be compatible with LN URL, has to be able to resolve that. And that will ping our LN bits legend instance, our server um, sitting in LN bits legend. And that, that uh, sends back a, 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 a concrete invoice to the user. So, um, you know, first couple steps are kind of hidden, but, you know, they scan it, they ping the server, the server sends back an invoice, and then the user pays the invoice. Upon receipt of the payment, the LN Bits legend, uh, legend sends a message over WebSocket. So this is one of the key components here. A WebSocket is just a tunnel that allows two-way communication between two devices over the internet. So the LN Bits legend server has a WebSocket with something called the Bitcoin switch, which is just a simple microcontroller uh, kit based on the ESP32. So the ESP32 has a, a pretty impressive setup. It's got Wi-Fi and a bunch of GPIOs, a bunch of other you know, lower level protocols that it can work with. And uh, it, it can, the, uh, Arc BTC did a really good job. He had a really good project that we used for this where we were able to hook it up to our LN Bits Legends uh, uh, server. And the LN Bits Legends server can send arbitrary messages, one of, one, one of which happens to be you know, open, uh, flip toggle digital output. So that causes that message causes the Bitcoin switch to toggle this digital output. The output pr then propagates through the system. It goes through a relay up to the, the door's 12 volt system. We're able to rig the 12 volt system such that it has or logic. So it has existing logic that is kind of outsider control. We also have the, um, so, so what we did was we kind of did surgery, put in a relay in parallel to that, that, that will, you know, mimic, uh, you know, you know, mimic that other circuit in, in such a way that it's or logic. So if we set, you know, if we toggle the digital output of the Bitcoin switch, it will uh, toggle that output and then it will, it will move the strike and it will open the door. And so then from there, we also hooked up, um, we hooked up a tw the 12 volt system to a 12 volt to 5 volt step down circuit and hooked it up to the 5 volt USB light lightning sign. So, kind of looks kind of convoluted. But it's actually pretty straightforward. This is pretty standard. Uh, if you build circuits, um, I can go into more detail if you guys have questions. But um, you know, this is how it works. It's on the GitHub page. Austin has a question. Uh, yeah, I guess. So two two small questions. The Bitcoin switch is that essentially just sending boolean? 
value? Yes. Does the Bitcoin switch send a Boolean value? Yeah, more or less. It, it, it's, it's just a digital output, which is just a Boolean. It's just a single bit output. And what, what exactly is the relay doing? I, I don't what, know. what exactly the, is the relay doing? So a relay is a common uh, component in electrical circuits. It's actually an electromagnetic, uh, sorry, an electromechanical circuit. So the way it works is you put in an input that is usually at a lower voltage or at a, vol a voltage that's maybe not compatible or, or two circuits you don't want to actually electrically touch. They're at, they're called, it's called isolation. And so it, it, the Bitcoin switch is a low, cir low voltage circuit, 3.3 volts. So you turn, you turn on the input of that and it actually creates a magnetic field that moves a physical switch. That physical switch controls the other circuit that's at a higher voltage where it wouldn't be safe to directly hook, hook it up to the GPIO or the, the digital output. Okay, so it's almost like a, a voltage converter. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah, yes, is it like a voltage converter? Yeah, it, in a, it's not really a step up, it, but it's, it's a level changer. It's a, it's a level changer for your, out, your digital circuit, yeah. Any other questions? Go. Okay. All right, I'm going to move into installation. So, how do we how do we actually install this? So, we went through this fancy block diagram. How do we install it? So, I'd say step one is going to be you got to go to LN Bits and enable the LN URL device plugin. So, there's several steps to that. You can set you know which GPIO pin, so they're numbered. The pins are numbered. You can decide you know which of those do what, when. You can decide the price for the invoice, so you could make it um, you, know, you can make it at varying amounts, um, and, and you just basically walk through their their uh, the, walk through their wizard. Next, you have to go to the Bitcoin Switch GitHub page. So, so ArcBTC, I have it in uh, the the GitHub page that I've put out on the broadcast and in the Slack channel. That has at the at the bottom it has the Bitcoin Switch archive for, or github from arcbtc so you could just pull that you can either flash it uh you know from the arduino ide or you can actually go to a website which i think i've also linked on the github and just flash it straight from your chrome browser and that will uh that will prompt you to put in all the information about the wi-fi password and uh, the you'll, you'll get like a a, a web socket uh, URL. You put all that information in, and it'll actually flash it to the device, to the Bitcoin Switch micro device, and that will uh, give you the ability to control the GPIO with the invoice payments. Okay, so we got you know the prerequisites done. We got kind of like the the more software side done. So now we got to get into the hardware. So. Um, First, you have to make sure that you you know you have to make sure it's flashed, and you have to. I, I would recommend that before you do any anything, just make sure that you know when you pay the invoice, you can turn on like an LED or something, something simple like that, just to prove to yourself that the digital output's working correctly. So next, we went into the control cabinet and we identified the circuit that would be the correct entry point. So we played around, we found some jumper uh, circuits, and we just played around until we figured out which one controlled the front door, and uh, you know, we were able to realize, you know, what exactly we had to do. We probed, we triple checked, made sure that, you know, basically we mimic the jumper by having it uh, in the nor normally closed position in the same way that it would be in the locked position. And then when it, when it opens, you know, when it receives a digital input, it's going to, it's going to flip the wiper to the other position and open the door. So, um, yeah, that's that's that, and then uh, and then we installed the AC to DC five volt circuit. So you can see on the right we have the timer switch that just get, plugs into the the five volt USB uh, converter that powers the BTC switch. So if we're outside of open hours, like I said, those con it actually is constantly rotating and once you hit outside the it has little pins that you press down so when you get outside the numbers uh the the, uh, the open hours it'll open the circuit and actually shut down the the switch so it won't be able to you know open the relay which is what we want and lastly you know put it all together we went downstairs we had to install some additional circuitry so we wanted this lightning bolt to light up when the strike circuit is active so we cut 
into the 12 volt circuit and kind of, uh, you know, ran parallel to that and put in a 12 volt to five volt step down into a J box and affixed it to, you know, the door. And then we you know, ran that to the five volt neon, neon light. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an electronics hoarder. I happen to have a bunch of stuff laying around, but you can, you can buy all kinds of step down converters that are capable of doing this, um, pretty much anywhere. Uh, and, and even get your custom solution. You can even run this off a of battery if you wanted to, if you want to get crafty. Uh, there's a lot of ways to skin this. But we set up that circuit, and then we went into, we, we, you know, last but not least, we printed out a nice-looking sign. Shout-out to Toshimoto. He made a really cool uh, QR code for us to use. So QR code, and then we also have the NFC-enabled sign that's from Max at Eden 3D Printers. So whichever ergonomics you like better personally i like the qr code a lot better because it's easier but uh both pretty cool and uh they both have the same static url you know programmed into them and uh, are you know thanks to the to, to ln url you're able to just put a static url and then have your server make a dynamic invoice you know at runtime any questions before i move on all right we're gonna we're gonna run this uh I'm going to show this demo here real quick. You see this? Okay. Yeah. I think that's necessary. Or it's like a working title. Lighting. So we got our man Topher here doing a demo. I'm calling it Lightning Door. It's like a working title. Lightning door? Okay, go Lightning for it. Door. So you tap the QR code. To Phoenix. Hey. Can, what would you call this? I'm calling it Lightning Door. It's like a working title. Lightning door? Okay, go Lightning for it. Door. So, so you tap the QR code. Oh, oh, this one doesn't have the lightning bolt? Okay, my bad. Okay, here we go. This one's got the lightning bolt. Look at that. You good? Yeah, so you can kind of see the evolution of this project. We you know, started without the lightning bolt, realized how it's kind of crappy UX if you don't know if the door is unlocked or not. So we ended up adding the lightning bolt, and I think it added uh, another uh, dimension of the UX. We, we had a speaker too, but it was kind of annoying. That's optional. Uh, but you could also just you could also just hook up like a five volt piezoelectric speaker, uh, too. It, it really depends on how you want to skin this cat. All right, so we went through you know the work we already did. Uh, let's get into future work. So some ways we can make it better. I would say probably the biggest thing we need to do. You know, this is very much sort of uh, you know proof of concept, but we definitely need to if we we're going to make this production grade. Uh, make the reliability a lot better. So I think one of the first things we're going to do, and we're kind of midway on this, is running our own custom server with an Ellen Bits instance. So instead of using Ellen Bits Legends, which is someone else's server, uh, we run it locally and be able be in more control of everything that happens and you know managing the liquidity, make sure it stays up, maybe even you know preventing it from from updating automatically, just so we know we have a stable version that's going to work for the door. So that's the first aspect the other would be in the bitcoin switch we notice that sometimes it just uh chokes out and it doesn't recover so we would just and i'm already working on this putting in a watchdog timer so we call this a watchdog timer when you have an independent system that kind of kicks the system if it gets gummed up in whatever capacity you can have it come in and reset everything so that so you can just start over so if we notice that you know there's no messages going through or that we're not connected to the internet we can just have it keep kicking on and off until you know, it does establish the important web socket. So that's connected to the Ellen, the Ellen Bits instance. And then, you know, so that's that's sort of more on the boring side of your reliability and all the things you have to do to make it more production grade. But then there's also other features we would add, such as you know, an admin dashboard. So the ability to dynamically set open hours to make it so that you don't necessarily need the mechanical timer. You could just set up you know, like uh, some kind of, uh, you know, back end app where, you know, a uh, car, whoever's, you know, running Pleb Lab could come in and change 
the open hours uh, dynamically. Suppose we're all, you know, in Nashville for 2024. Uh, you, you could just turn off, you know, that access control system uh, for better security. And then also the ability to add different SKUs for different pass types. So you have people that you know, maybe are monthly people that already you know, paid in bulk. And then you have people that are coming in on Nomad passes or daily passes, having the ability to offer different SKUs or products uh, for, from that, uh, for, you know, to, to administrate those and then offer different SKUs, you know, based on uh, what the user needs. And then also just retaining information about the user between sessions. So using outline auth or one of these other technologies to kind of, you know, know this is a monthly user. They already paid. We have to collect payment again, you know, versus this is somebody that's coming in on a, on a daily pass as their first, uh, their first entry into Plat Lab today. So, you know, that's, that's the future work we need for this project, but you know, this has kind of spurred a, a discussion. I know that the guys at Bitcoin Park are pretty excited about this too, about you know how we barely scratch the surface of you know how we can marry lightning with the physical world. What else can we do? You know, I've heard a lot of people talk about vending machines. I know Topher's messing around with the slot machine right now. I'll probably help him with that. Topher did uh, an arcade machine, so it's Raspberry Pi based arcade machine. We got all these retro games here. You can play at Pleb Lab based on you know paying lightning invoices. We got claw machines. Um, I've seen somebody streaming sats on a power meter, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I'd even go as far as to say that, um, you, you could probably have like a beer machine. I think somebody, I think somebody at Prague is doing that right now. I actually just saw that, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can do with lightning and hardware. And I'm curious to see where this goes and how things evolve. Where, you know, we had the internet in the nineties and then it just became like the internet cafe. And then it became Starbucks. I think we're at the same point right now when you have Bitcoin Lightning at the fabric of everything. And then it becomes maybe it's like these, you know, these these kind of hacker spaces, these Bitcoin parks, these Bitcoin commons. And then us as Bitcoiners, we have these buildings. The buildings that we own are staying humble and sat and sat. And I literally think that's how we can save the yeah. real estate industry, you know? Yeah, so Car's just saying for the people at home, Car's just saying how you know he thinks we're kinda of at the same point with Bitcoin that we were in the internet with, you know, internet cafes, maybe it wasn't, you know, the internet wasn't evenly distributed. Maybe it wasn't, you know, super accessible to the average person, but we're starting to get to the point where we're evolving and starting to become more mainstream. And we're going to be able to do a lot of really interesting things at a Pleb Lab, at a Bitcoin park, at a Bitcoin commons, you know, elsewhere, uh, doing interesting things with sats and, you know, having, you know, having this place, you know, generate sats basically uh, based on exchange of value for value. So I'm here for, it. I love lightning. I love hardware. I love, I love building stuff. So if you guys have ideas, you know, drop it in the comments of the GitHub. Uh, sh you know, shoot me questions if you want help on your projects. Happy to help. Love love building stuff. Love and help other people that have a passion for building stuff. I don't really use Arduino. If I'm going to do something like this, I usually just get into the C and just forget about whatever the hell Arduino is doing. It's pretty similar. But um, I guess I can't. This sucks because I can't, I can't do both at the same time. But I guess, you know, really... He's got a bunch of libraries for Wi-Fi, web servers, um, SPI, which is just serial peripheral interface. It's a pretty fast interface. Um, he's got Wire, which I think is just I squared C. It's just a fancy name for I squared C. Um, he's got a WebSocket client. So I can't, I gotta like turn this towards me because I can't see that. Okay. Yeah, so he's just got a whole bunch of setup. I mean, this is pretty... This is pretty hacked together because it's all in one. It's all in one file too. Did Super write it? Maybe, yeah. Maybe Super Testnet did write it. He's actually Arc BTC. It's a plot twist. Yeah. So I, I guess they have different. Uh, this looks like he, this is just like a generic uh, credentials JSON. But I think what happens when you program is it'll actually it'll actually pull this from memory, and populate it with whatever your Wi-Fi credentials and your, your, um, you know, your socket URL is. And let's see here. No, those are, those are default from what I remember. I don't know. Maybe I did. Maybe I gotta, maybe I gotta take this down. <laughs> is that, is that, can you read setup? I can't see. Yeah. We want to see. I don't, th I don't think it's in there. I gotta, I gotta double check. I can't, I'm not, I'm looking at different code than you guys, slightly different code. So I'll double check, but, um, 
All right, so the setup's pretty straightforward. He serial begin just means he's setting the baud rate and then um, you know starting his comms protocol using M five. So I guess there's a there's a version of this that has like a has a custom uh, like screen that allows it to uh, you know display things. Uh, we didn't use that. We didn't need it. We just needed to literally take all toggle on output and I guess it does okay so it does some setup it does some like initial it, it's toggling a GPIO it's checking to see if it's got this M5 like most of this code honestly doesn't doesn't matter to us because we don't use the M5 uh, and uh, let's see Uh, there's, there's no, there's no, the code, the code in here, listen, it's looking for an LCD screen basically. So we're not using that. And so, okay, then, so, so that's like a bunch of setup, but then there it's looking at the param file. So it's looking to set up, it's reading this JSON document. So I think it's just going to overwrite all that, like, uh, you know, pseudo code we saw earlier. No, this is like, a st honestly, the main thing it's doing is establishing a connection to the server with a WebSocket and, re and reading the credentials to do so. So that's honestly probably like 90% of this code does. That's what all these JSON objects are about. The code is running on an ESP32 micro, and then it just has one digital output. It's literally just higher or low circuit that turns on the relay, which which then turns on oh, everything else. Yeah. Yeah. It's a web socket plus like a digital output. It's really not that complicated. I was surprised by how like confused people were about this to be honest, but, um, it's pretty much it. I mean, there's a lot of code in here, but the gist of it is that it establishes a web socket and then it toggles a GPIO when you pay an invoice for, uh, and it toggles it for a given amount of time that's configurable. So you can set it to, 15 seconds that uh i don't know where it is in this code i think it i think it's in the message actually that tells it what to do and you set that up in your ln bits instance so you're like i need pin 13 you can change the pins too you can be like it's config in ln bits yeah and it and it, i think it just reads the variable from the message so so I, I'm going to get into the guts of this code later, and I'll pro what I'll probably do is just uh, put in a watchdog timer, which is really simple. Just make it so that if it gets offline for any reason, it'll at least try to reset and recover. Because what we notice is sometimes, like, I think it doesn't like being turned on and off by the mechanical switch, so it might go into, like, under voltage lockout for some time and just get gummed up forever, which is, you know, it's all beta software. But if you're shipping something that's production, usually you handle that type of case. Yeah, reboot it. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thanks, everybody.